Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds. Welcome to Ape's video notes for topic 9.8, which will cover invasive species. Our objective for the day is to be able to explain the environmental problems associated with invasive species. And the skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video is proposing a solution to an environmental problem, in this case, invasive species. So we'll start off today by just covering some invasive species basics. So an invasive species is a non-native species that is usually introduced to an ecosystem through human activity. And so an example here is the zebra mussel. We can see that the human activity of boating, moving boats around from different lakes to different rivers is going to allow the zebra mussels to attach to those boats and be transported. So they'll be introduced into ecosystems that they weren't previously found in. Another thing to know about invasives is that they are typically going to thrive as they don't have a natural predator in the ecosystem, uh, which they come to find themselves in. So when a species evolves over millions of years in an ecosystem or a native habitat, typically predators evolve alongside of it. And so something is going to use the organism as a food source or prey on it. But when you just introduce a species to a new habitat, oftentimes there's not gonna be a native predator there to control that population. Another characteristic of invasive species would be that they're oftentimes highly competitive. So they could be aggressive feeders or they could outcompete other organisms for space or other important ecosystem services like soil nutrients or you know water. And so this is gonna give them kind of an upper hand. They can also usually thrive in their non-native habitats. So they're very adaptable. And we'll talk about what that means shortly. Another example of an invasive species is the Burmese python. So the Burmese python was introduced to Florida uh, as a part of the exotic animal trade. People had them as pets, but then didn't want them and released them. And we can see here that they are eating basically any mammal they can fit their heads around. So they have anything here from a deer to someone's poor uh, household pet, a cat. They've even been seen eating alligators. And so they're very adaptable and they have very aggressive feeding habits. Typically, invasive species will fall into the R selected or generalist category. Um, I should say those are different categories, R selected and generalist. So they're oftentimes one or the other or both. Uh, and this is because our selected species are more likely to be really rapid reproducers. They're gonna have a higher biotic potential typically, and that makes them prone to becoming invasive. It makes them prone to reproducing rapidly in a new ecosystem, typically without control from predators or without control from competing species, and it enables them to rapidly take over. Another issue that we've discussed a little bit with the Python is that they're highly adaptable. So they can usually adapt to the new conditions. They can tolerate the new precipitation or temperature conditions they're in. And they can usually adapt to the new food sources that are found in the ecosystem to which they're introduced. So again, a generalist is going to be able to do these things, whereas a specialist is going to have a harder time just being dropped into a new ecosystem and thriving. Now we'll go over some kind of textbook AP environmental science invasive species examples that you need to know. So the first one is the zebra mussel. Zebra mussel is a small mussel that's native to the Black and Caspian Seas, but as I mentioned earlier, was introduced into the United States and Canada via the St. Lawrence Seaway. So these large cargo ships carried zebra mussels in their ballast water. Ballast water is water that these ships take on in order to help them stay balanced as they're sailing or as they're you know, traveling from port to port. But then typically when they get to their destination, they discharge the ballast water and these zebra mussels were discharged with the ballast water and then found themselves in the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Great Lakes ecosystem. Now this is an issue because they are very, very aggressive filter feeders. So what they do is they absorb the water or they take the water in an ecosystem through their bodies and filter out small bits of particulate. It could be sediment, could be small zooplankton or algae, and that's what they're gonna eat as their food source. This is a problem because it can outcompete other organisms that rely on that same food source. Because they are so aggressive in their feeding, it can really, again, give them a leg up on other animals or other organisms in that ecosystem that rely on those sediments or those algae as a food source. They can also lay up to a million eggs a year, and so they're going to be really, really rapid reproducers. They have an extremely high biotic potential, and this is going to enable them to just uh, proliferate and just spread like wildfire throughout their ecosystem. Uh, so much so that they're able to even clog intake pipes very quickly in a matter of months. And so they reproduce so rapidly and attach themselves to basically anything that there's many instances of intake pipes. So these could be pipes that are bringing in water, 
you know, for any number of industrial purposes or agriculture, you know, from the Great Lakes or from other lakes. And it's just going to clog these pipes because they just reproduce so rapidly and fill them up. And so they can cause a lot of economic damages. Another important invasive example to note is the kudzu vine. So the kudzu vine is this really rapidly growing vine that was established across the southern United States in the 1930s to try to combat some of the dust bowl conditions that had really decimated U.S. agriculture. And so, you know, it was brought in with great intentions to stabilize the sides of roads, to stabilize you know, farming soil and limit erosion. But it became invasive because it grows so rapidly. There have been estimates that they can grow up to a foot of foot a day. I don't know how accurate that is scientifically, but that's a number that circulates on the Internet. And they're going to outcompete native plants for resources like sunlight and water and grow right over native plants and shade them out. And so you can think of them as kind of choking out the competition when it comes to other plants. Another issue is that they really don't have a native uh, herbivore pressure in the southeastern United States. So there hasn't been an animal that has evolved alongside them to eat them and use them as a food source. And then another example is the Asian carp. The Asian carp is a really aggressive feeding fish uh, that was initially introduced to control algae populations in aquatic farms, but then escaped into the Mississippi River. Now the problem here is in the Mississippi River, they really outcompete native fish species uh, and eat a lot of the food source they need and just physically take up the space that these other fish need. They take up the oxygen that other fish need. And so they're really, really invasive. They're really good at displacing native species from the Mississippi River. An issue here is that this is gonna decrease fishery value. So we like to commercially or recreationally fish different populations from the Mississippi River, some of the lakes you know, that branch off from this system and the Asian carp decrease the value of these fisheries. They can even injure boaters or cause damage to boats because when boats drive through an area where there are a lot of Asian carp, they can oftentimes jump out of the water and they can be really heavy fish. So they can even cause injury you know, to people, they can cause damages to boats. And so a lot of economic costs associated with the Asian carp. Another important invasive species is the emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer was actually discovered right here in Michigan in 2002. And it's believed that was introduced through wood packaging materials that were shipped here, either on planes or on boats. And it's gonna be really problematic for the ash population of the United States because the ash borer lays its larvae into the bark of these trees. The larvae then eat their way into the phloem. So they eat through the bark into the layers of the tree and if you remember your, your biology knowledge here, uh, the phloem is a really important plant structure that's going to enable it to transport nutrients and water. And so when these larvae eat their way in, you see these almost little pathways carved uh, into the phloem of the tree. If you peel back the bark, you can see them. They look almost like little termite tunnels just all over the tree. And they're going to kill the tree really rapidly. Uh, an issue here is that the emerald ash borer is having its range expanded as global warming leads areas that used to freeze earlier in the year and stay frozen for longer periods of time, it leads to them thawing out earlier and staying frozen for shorter periods of time. So that's gonna expand basically the whole season for the emerald ash borer and enable them to spread to areas that were previously too cold. And finally, we'll wrap up today by talking about the control methods for invasives. So first we need to understand why is it such a problem that we have invasive species? Why do we need to control them? Well, a 2005 study concluded that the United States annually loses about $120 billion of economic activity uh, or costs associated with invasives. And so that's a problem. Now, where do these costs come from? Well, they come from things like la lost agricultural productivity. They come from things like tourism uh, income declining. They come from lost fishery productivity. They come from issues where we have to control and remove them that costs money. Uh, they even come from things like property value decline. So think about if you own a home and it's surrounded by ash trees and the emerald ash board descends on your property and, you know, kills all those trees, your home's value has actually changed or your property value, I should say. If you're a nursery that sells ash trees and the emerald ash borer decimates your stock, you've lost a lot of profit. So there's a lot of examples of how invasives can actually cost money. If you're a fisherman, who makes your living fishing and the Asian carp really decimates the stock of fish that you harvest commercially, you know, you've lost income. So many examples of how invasives can be really costly. So how do we control them? How do we, you know, mitigate or reduce their spread? Well, we can have laws that try to prevent the transport of invasives. And a great example is 
you know, the state of Minnesota and other states that are really trying to crack down on firewood transport because firewood can oftentimes contain the emerald ash borer. And so controlling its transportation and spreading awareness about transporting firewood can try to prevent the spreads. So you see this great image here, don't let this become this. And you have, you know, a thriving forest on the left and then you have, you know, kind of a decimated ash forest on the right. And so you need to be careful of the firewood that you're transporting. We can also remove the hosts of invasives. And so something that might seem counterintuitive, but can actually be really effective at controlling emerald ash borer is going through and cutting down ash trees, especially dead ash trees in a dense forest population. When you thin out the population of ash trees, you reduce the likelihood that the emerald ash borer is able to spread. And so removing the host can actually really help control the spread of invasives. Another example is careful inspection of boats and removal of what are sometimes called aquatic hitchhikers. So the zebra mussel is a great example, but there are many others of aquatic invasives that if boats are inspected carefully, uh, their spread can be really limited. So this could look like recreational boaters spraying off the bottom of their boat or just getting down and you know pulling off aquatic plants that may be attached. Uh, or it could even look like the inspection of ships that come into ports and making sure they've dumped their ballast water before they get to port and that they're not bringing in invasive aquatics or aquatic invasives. Then we have the introduction of natural predators. And so you can do what's called biological control. So if you think back to unit five, we learned about this with IPM, integrated pest management. And we can do the same thing for invasives. So a great example here is this Chinese wasp. Uh, there's three different species of Chinese wasp that have been recently introduced to areas like Michigan and, and other areas of the Northeast and the Midwest to try to control the emerald ash borer. And so this particular wasp paralyzes the emerald ash borer and then carries it back to its larvae uh, to feed it to them. And so that's a great example. There are also uh, parasitic wasps that will lay their eggs in the emerald ash borer's larvae. And so great examples of biological control or introducing a natural predator to control an invasive. And then finally, we can just do good old fashioned physical removal. And so my students and I have actually participated in garlic mustard polls at Blanford Nature Center in West Michigan where I teach. And so that's a great way to just, you know, roll up your sleeves and put elbow grease to the problem and, and physically pull out the invasive. We can do this with pythons as well. As I mentioned in Florida, there are aggressive hunting campaigns where people actually go out and try to trap and kill them. And we can do it with zebra mussels by physically kind of spraying them off boats or intake valves or just, you know, using rakes or whatever we can to, to you know, just physically remove the invasive species. So for practice of our Q9.8 today, I want you to identify a specific example of an invasive species and then propose a solution to reduce the spread of that invasive species.